Murray Alton. My wife has already informed me that she will be pointing at her watch <laughs> whenever she feels my time is up. So, um, <laughs> um, of course, we uh, miss having Brother Larry here uh, and him and his. Uh, in his uh, rightful place, but uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, the ox is in the ditch, or in other times, some people put your ox in the ditch yeah. for you, and then you have to work the rest of the evening to get them out. Um, but uh, it is what it is, and the Lord knows all about it, and if he's listening. Hopefully, uh, this will uh, bless him as well. Um, are there any prayer requests before we begin tonight? All right, well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn over to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11, this is a very commonly preached from text and, and a story that has been told in recent old in fact, we sort of summarized it in my class uh, Sunday uh, because we were looking at Psalm 51, which relates very closely to this story. But actually what we're going to be talking about tonight has very little to do with the, with the sin that is outlined here in this chapter. It actually has something to do something close to the front. So in the first verse of the 11th chapter, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Reba, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. So Lord, we're a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house before your people to preach the word that you've given us, dear Lord. Please uh, allow us to convey the, the thoughts and the teaching that you have given us to them with clear mind and clear speech, dear Lord. We pray that you would send your Holy Ghost by and touch each one Amen. here. And for those that aren't uh, able to be with us, that you would be with them, that you would touch them and make them uh, uh, comforted in the place that they're in. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Now what I want to talk about uh, is where do your priorities lie? The opening of this chapter tells us that David had better things to do than the job that was that was given him, that was outlined him, that the Lord had called him to do. He, um, if you had, if you didn't know, David was not the first king of Israel. Uh, Saul was what was the king Israel wanted when they first asked for a king, and then David was the king that God wanted them to have after they decided they wanted to have a king. If that all makes sense. Um, and he was the one that Samuel specifically anointed while Saul was still reigning on the throne. Uh, uh, to, to my, my point of fact. So, but we get to this idea of priorities. What is a priority? A, a, a priority is a condition of being regarded or treated as more important. Um Google sometimes will define things with also the, the British meaning of the English word. I actually like the British definition better. It says, the right to take precedence or to proceed before others. A priority is something that we set ahead of all other things. You know, of course, I deal a lot with the church's networking and stuff, and actually I'm having some issues right now trying to uh, trying to get everything the way that I want it. Um, but in networking or with Wi-Fi, there's something, there's some of them have software inside of them that will allow you to set priorities for different things. For instance, let's say that there's five devices. Let's say the three cell phones and a computer and a smart TV. And let's say that Papa is watching his smart TV, but Mamma's on her phone playing or doing whatever, checking Facebook or doing whatever, and it is interfering with his TV watching. In that Wi-Fi software, you can set the TV as a high priority for that software. And so when it comes to 
when the Wi-Fi says, I can fetch one thing. I can either go get the Facebook page that's being requested, or I can go get that TV show that's also being requested. It knows, well, the TV's been high-prioritized. So I'm going to go get the TV show, and then when I've delivered that, then I'm going to hand off the Facebook page because it has got the highest priority. When we, in our lives, I, I think sometimes we think when we have to set priority for Christian things, that, we're, we're, that, we, that means at the expense of all other things, that we must set God as our highest priority, when in actuality, what all God wants to be is first. He wants to he wants to be ahead. He wants the right to proceed all of the thing of all of the things. Do you do you, do you have things that must be accomplished on Sunday morning? I'm sure you do because I have stuff that has to be accomplished on Sunday morning. And, and, and a lot for whatever reason, a lot of times there's more things to accomplish on Sunday morning than any other morning of the week. But God requires us to place Him in a place of high priority. In this text, we find that David and his priorities were not where they needed to be. It was his duty and expectation as a king of Israel to go to battle. But the text says, if you read the bottom of verse 1, he tarried still at Jerusalem. It goes further in verse 2, and we'll go ahead and read that. And it came to pass in evening time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the house, of the king's house, I'm sorry. And, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now negating the fact that here begins his sin of lust, what is the implication of David's priority as king of Israel? David was supposed to be going to battle, but what kept him at home? If you look at verse 2, he just wanted to be at ease. He, he wanted a vacation. He wanted some time off. You know, Joab was a very good tactician. If you look in the middle of verse 1, who he sent to battle, his general had been with him since he was on the run from Saul. Joab was a smart tactician. He was a valiant warrior. He was, he was one of David's closest advisors. Now, as things went on, it got, it got less good uh, uh, for him. But ultimately... Uh, Joel was not a bad choice. But David's responsibility was to be there, and instead he substituted his God-given responsibility for his ease, for his relaxing, which ultimately led to other sins. Uh, he, 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 his, his whole sin with Bathsheba was predicated because he placed his, his wants and his needs above the wants and needs of God that he had been placed inside of. Uh, there are I, I, the, the, there are many things in the scripture I think that you could talk about where, when it comes to setting these priorities. I only want to look at, at three different things that, that are alternate priorities that all, oftentimes we set. And I'll even go as far as to say this. The ones that we're going to look at, a lot of time, even in churches, uh, uh, take the place of uh, the um, a lot of time, if you look at the churches, there are there are there are other priorities set outside the, the the church that most church going folks say, oh yeah, well that's that's totally a priority. This is something that this is something that you need to do. So we're going to go to the first one, and I don't think this is necessarily one of those. We're going to go to the first one, uh, Luke chapter twelve, Luke. Chapter 12, in verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not of, of the, in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And, and, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. 
But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who sh shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body uh, what shall ye put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Now, I think the first alternate priority that in most cases that we place above um, any other duty that we have toward God, toward our relationship with God, is financial gain. Is is your big air quotes career? What what you need to do to achieve the Almighty dollar? This is a this parable is the man in this parable is not initially doing anything wrong. What does he get? The Lord blesses a crop that he has. So he goes and he thinks to himself, "What am I going to do with all these things?" He says, well, I probably should store it. The place where he gets <coughs> off is that this now has taken his full, um, I'm trying to think of the word that I'm, that, that I'm looking for, um, his full, the, the fulfillment of his life from this point on is found within the work of that stuff. He says, Soul, you have many things for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. You have you have invested, you have done every you have you, you have laid up, you have worked hard, you've done this. You, 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 you. There's, there's there, never is the Lord acknowledged from whence comes all gain for all people on, on the earth. I mean, the Bible even says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Uh, this man had this man had had worked hard and had reaped bountifully and that was going to be his life. That was where all of his fullness, all of his fulfillment, everything that in his life would be done. And we see a lot of this today. We see we, we see we see people. Well, uh, hey, my my job does take. You know, unfortunately, you know, some Sundays I just have to work. Some days I just have to do this. You know what? It, the church is the church is having a prayer meeting. Well, I, I have more important things to do. I have I have this and I, even I, even I'll go as far as to say that I have been guilty of this from time to time. When we have uh, when we go out to these festivals and stuff, usually everybody's there in the morning and guess who's not there? Sadly enough, it's me. I, I work on Saturday morning, and it, it, it is a fact of my job. But is that a good enough excuse? Where is the priority setting whenever, when every time that it comes up, do I choose A or do I choose B? Do I choose God or do I choose my job? Do I choose God or do I choose a dollar? Do I choose God or do I choose advancement in my career? And we always take B. We have we have made it clear, even if it isn't in so many words, where our priority lies. And I think Jesus in verse 23 kind of sets this in stark relief when he says, The life is more than me, and the body is more than raiment. That means that your body has more purpose outside of what it can consume, what it can take in, what you can... I mean, because that's what work is, isn't it? I mean, we, we, we work for money, which is basically a currency to trade our work for somebody else to gain things. We, 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 we eat and we put on and everything. And, and, and he said, your body is worth so much more than that. It, 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 the rest of the, Later in the New Testament, Paul calls your body a living sacrifice. The, 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 these are the things we're supposed to do to it. I think Jesus was sort of, was sort of pointing out to that. The second alternate priority that I think every person in here, if I was supposed to, uh, uh, if I was to ask them about a list of priorities, it would be somewhere on the list is your family. An alternate priority being your family. Luke chapter nine. Luke nine verse fifty nine, and he said to another, "Follow me." But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. 
And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I, I don't think it's, you know, if, if you look at this entire, this entire text where he, is, where he is calling to people to follow him, and they're giving him different response, that two of them have to do with your family. Who among us would say that there's anything more important than attending your own father's funeral? Who among us would say that there's anything more important than this sort of rock dwelling in tearful goodbye that this man wanted to make before he would follow Jesus? But Jesus very specifically says, if you're determined that you're going to be a disciple, if you're determined that I'm the top priority, you can't start the row with your plow and then look back over your shoulder at everything that you're leaving behind. Now, does this mean that families, that, that Jesus deems families as less? No, I didn't say that. And I kind of go back to what I was talking about, that the, the, the Wi-Fi analogy. Just because something's at the top of the priority list does not mean that other things don't have somewhere in that priority line. The Bible is very clear in 1 Timothy 5, 8, that if a man provide not for his own, that he's worse than an infidel. Uh, we understand that God expects us to love and care for our families. God created families. In Eden, he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Didn't he not? God wants us to, to, to love and be there for our families. But once you have determined to do something for the Lord... It is the top of the priority list. It comes first. And Jesus, and, and Jesus is, it makes it, I think, very clear in, six, in, in verse 62 here that it's not an option. To, and and I, the, the plowing analogy that he's using here is because you have to sort of look ahead to plow a straight road. You can't, you can't be looking over your shoulder. You can't be looking side to side because the animal in front of you needs guidance. Without it, he's just going to go wherever he thinks he needs to go at, and probably it's going to go over into your turnip patch or, 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 or over there next to the corn or wherever he wants to be. Because, But you have to have your eyes forward. You have to be focused on what is the most important. You have to be focused on the work that you're doing. So, it, you know, if whatever your job is, whatever the Lord has called you to do, and he has called you to do something specific, and you say, well, he had called me to do anything specific, that's because you're not looking. God does not create vessels for decoration. Um, you, you, we live in a society now, and it's kind of a decadent one, where, where you know we have you know, like this box up here, you know, j just for these fake plants, or you know, you see vases that have got you know just you know decorative flowers and stuff. And there was a time in human society where you didn't have decorative vases. The vases were designed for something, and even a decorative vase has a purpose. So if, if, if the potter's hands have laid the clay and has made you as one of his own, you have a design specific for something. And whatever that is, once you find it and you start going toward it, if you ever look back, you have said, Lord, what you want, what you have designed, what you have created is somehow lesser than whatever it is I'm placing. And, and in this case, for these two gentlemen in, in, in the, in the uh, narrative that we see here in Luke 9, it was their family. And I don't think there's a single person in here, and, and maybe this has to do with something with um, um, uh, the American idea, that would say that either one of these men had done anything wrong. If somebody in this church missed services because they were over at Anglins, nobody would have a problem with that. <clears throat> Jesus says here, let the dead bury their dead. You have made a determination to follow me. So you either prioritize your family and go that path, or you prioritize me. And that, that seems very harsh and very stark and, 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 and black and white, but the, the, this, 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 is the, this is the determination that God, that, that God has laid out for us. Uh, the last alternate priority that you might place above the Lord is your lifestyle. Now, lifestyle, I'm going to take a whole different kind of, you know, all different kinds of ways of living. But I'm specifically talking about how you live 
your day-to-day -day life. Uh, the TV you watch, the internet sites you visit, the conversation or your, your attitude, your, 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 your vocabulary, uh, 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 what, you decide to, what you decide to wear, how you're living, basically, that, that lifestyle is what we're talking about here. Let's go to Genesis uh, chapter 13. Genesis 13. In verse 8. Now, uh, Lot and Abraham have been having some trouble with their cattlemen fighting one another because they both of them were incredibly wealthy gentlemen and both of them had a lot of flocks and the land could not contain them both and so there was strife and verse 8 says and Abraham said unto Lot let there be no strife I pray thee between me and thee and uh, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen for we be brethren is not the whole land before thee separate thyself I pray thee from me if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou come, comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. And Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pinched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up down, uh, now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever here we have a, a situation where these two men are dividing and Abraham poses a question to Lot you take a path and I'm going in the opposite direction and that way there won't be any fighting between us because you're my nephew, and I love you, and I don't think that we should have to have this situation. Now, I believe that is exactly what Abraham was saying here. In fact, he, he beseeched the Lord. He doesn't out and out say it, but Abraham beseeched the Lord on behalf of Lot when God was tell, telling him about destroying Sodom. Um, so Lot looks out across the world. Lot, a man who had followed Abraham on this godly promise, we could even say that Lot was a man as godly as Abraham. You know, of all the people in the city of Sodom, only one person and one person's family was saved, and that was Lot. I believe, I personally believe Lot was a saved man. I just think he just so got so bogged down in different things. And this is the moment that led to it. See, Lot looked out over all the things that he could survey. You don't see here Lot asking the Lord for direction. You don't see Lot trying to look for uh, a place where he can best serve the Lord. You don't see uh, Lot uh, examining the terrain, saying this is, this is where God wants us to be. No, Lot looks out there. The first thing he sees is, ah, over there, they got good ground, and I have a lot of um, animals to feed. <coughs> Second thing is, and it seems like it was very apparent, Sodom and Gomorrah was known for a very, very specific lifestyle. They were exceedingly wicked. It was, a, it was common knowledge. And he looked over everything there was, and he started moving in that direction. He made a conscious decision to get fur closer and closer to the world, and that lifestyle, and the lifestyle that they upheld in the city of Sodom, and further and further away from Abraham, from the will of God, from, from any, any, anything that, that was remotely supposed to be what, it, what was his. You know, um, and, I and I believe it was the lifestyle there that, that Lot wanted because Genesis 19 tells us and, and, and it kind of insinuates that, if you, especially if you read those first three verses, he, when the angels come to the gates of Sodom, 
Lot had gone beyond pitching his tent towards Sodom. He was living in the city. And he, he knew exactly who these two men were. Now, I personally think they were aspects of the Trinity in human form. But even if they were just angels, and they're described as angels in Genesis, so let's just leave it at that. He, uh, he, he knew what they were. He immediately runs out to them before they can greet anybody, before they can enter the city. He's standing there at the grave. He bows himself down to them and says, come, come, come into my house. I'll wash your feet. We'll eat. And in the morning, you can be on your way. He wanted to insulate them from the city. He wanted the experience that these two, uh, th these two uh, uh, heavenly figures uh, had to be one that he could curate. Um, uh, he, uh, he, it even goes on further in that chapter to say that he takes them in, he washes their feet, which sounds a lot like the Passover, the, the Passover that Jesus uh, had with his disciples. He washes their feet, they have unleavened bread, uh, and, and then sort of chaos breaks loose when the men of the city can pass the house around, and it sort of breaks the illusion. But that type of um, prioritization of lifestyle coupled with uh, the fact that he didn't want the angels to see kind of feels the way I see a lot of um, Christians living. We, we have, we have our, our, our church life and we have our, our real life. And so our real life we live six days a week and kind of a couple of days on sun, a couple of hours on Sunday on either side of services, and then we come to church. We uh, we, we we show up at the approved time with the approved dress, uh, with the approved language, um, and approved conversational topics. We put on the the Christian mask for the length of time of the services and the time of fellowship. And as soon as we relieve, we return to where we really want to live. You see, we've prioritized how we want to live over how the Lord wants us to live. And I, I think Lot, if you look at this chapter 13, this is where he made that decision. And we, we make it too. Make no mistake, especially if you're saved, there is someone, and it's not just anybody, it's the Holy Spirit, in the back of your head at all times telling you, hey, how you're living is not how I want you to live with me inside of you. And instead, we live that, and then we come to church and we try to sanitize the exterior for everybody to see. And then when we go back home, it's, it's, it's more of the same. You, you haven't placed God on any kind of priority list. Uh, he, he, he's, he's of the lowest priority in that situation. Why? Because six days a week, you're, 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 you're living exactly how you want to live. And, and now, okay, for, for a little while, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend to be Christian, we'll sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, and then we won't think about church again until maybe Wednesday night, depending on, you know, if all the stars align and if the moon is in the right phase and all this other stuff. And it, and it is... Um, and it is not where God wants us to set our priority. And it is worth saying in this chapter, and I did this the reason that I read the last 14 and 15 here. Um, when Abraham set his priority straight, immediately God spoke to him. When, when Abraham got rid of something that, and Abraham, of all the people in the Old Testament, you could say he clung to his family as hard as he could. He, he, he wanted anybody to be his heir, but the way that God wanted it to be. Uh, and Lot was part of that initial plan. He took, God told him, leave with nothing but Sarah and your herdsmen and get out. And Abraham said, great idea. I'm going to take my nephew Lot with me. <laughs> and, and, and But as soon as he got right, as soon as he got straight with the Lord, immediately, verse 14, the Lord says, all right, now I'm going to make a promise. Now that you've got everything straight, now I'm going to make a promise to you. Now look north and south and east and west. Everything you can see, that's going to be yours and your people's forever. Now, that's not a promise that he made to him before. So what is the priority? Luke 14 is going to be our final text here. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 16. Then it... Uh, 
Uh, let's go to 15. And one of them sat at me um, with him, heard, heard these things, and said to him, Blessed is he that uh, shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he, speaking of the Lord, said unto him, A certain man, uh, man bade a great supper, um, um, bade, made a great supper, and bade many. Then sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. Pray thee, have me excuse. The other said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and shoot his lord these things. And the master of the house, being angry, said unto the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. The servant said, Lord, it is... It is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of these men which were uh, uh, were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there, was a, uh, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said to them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come up, come after me cannot be my disciple. Now Jesus, and I think there's a lot of things that you could apply to the parable that he tells here of the Master and his Supper. But what I want to point out here is preparations have been made for you, and the Lord's not looking for excuses. Right. The Lord's not looking for you. And, and look at the kind of excuses that were made by these people. One bought a piece of land and he wanted to go, you know, take a look, kind of celebrate that, you know, he bought a piece of land. One married a wife. Who, who, would, who would expect anybody to do something for the Lord on their honeymoon? You know? Um, and then he wraps this whole thing up in verse 26. It says, if any man hate not his father and his mother and his children and his brethren and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The Lord makes it certain and uh, makes it clear in no uncertain terms. He and his service is the top priority. It kind of comes back to the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, uh, 3 through 5, it says very clearly, Thou shalt not bow th down thyself to them, uh, nor serve them, for I, the Lord... Thy God am a jealous God, in reference to the commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He alone wants to be served. Right? This, this, this jealousness that God possesses means that not only does He want to be the top priority, He demands it. And everything that you set out in front of Him, He deems to be a God, and He is jealous. You know, if somebody was to begin uh, making advancements toward my wife, I would be jealous, and it might cause me to beat that person down. Somebody, you know, that, that, that may not be a very Christian attitude to have, but, uh, but that is the type of jealousness that God has. You're mine. I bought you. I paid for you. I, 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 I suffered Calvary's Hill for you, and you have no business... Setting anybody else's priorities over mine. It'd be just like this. And this is better than, than someone making advances to my wife. What if we had a guest there at the house and, and, and the guest decided to have an extended stay at our house and every time anything needed to be done by my wife for me, she always prioritized that other fellow that was living there with us over me. What do we begin to think? Does she love me? A am, am, am I not her husband? Am, am I not of the most priority? To her, I, I have I have a I have a ring and a piece of paper that that, that 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 says that we consider each other the top of the fleshly priorities that there are. And God looks down and He sees us doing every other thing but serve and worship Him, and He goes, "What's the deal?" The priority is the whole giving of yourself to the Lord, placing Him above all. 
And can we deny him that after his sacrifice? Where do your priorities lie? Very interesting question to place upon ourselves in a time where there's so many things to distract us, to pull us away, to make us, to make themselves our God. Mm -hmm. 